Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the premiere of Coleslaw's Corner, Science in Drag. I'm James Wetzel, the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science, and I'm so thrilled to introduce tonight's premiere episode. It is no surprise that we at the Museum of Science love ourselves some coleslaw. We are so proud of this continued collaboration with this artist. Uh, it's been over, I think, two years at this point since we kicked off our award-winning Coleslaw's Corner experiences in the immersive setting of the Charles Hayden Planetarium. And we are so excited to get back on site and into that dome with all of you to continue that work. Uh, in the meantime, tonight was supposed to be one of those live shows. Unfortunately, we can't all be in the same room currently. So we sat down with Coleslaw and our team came up with this wonderfully outrageous virtual new concept uh, and collaboration with Coleslaw and we're so thrilled to share it with you tonight. Inspired by the legendary TV personalities like Oprah and Barbara Walters, each episode will find Coleslaw sitting down and interviewing one of the Museum of Science's experts or educators, researchers, and really examining STEM through Coleslaw's incredibly unique and fabulous perspective. And this first episode is just an incredible and joyous thing, and we hope that you enjoy it and that it brings everyone a little bit of entertainment into their homes during this time. And tonight is a part of our virtual season of adult programming. We have turned the Museum of Science into a virtual museum, offering free STEM-related programming on a daily basis across our digital platforms. As a part of that, we have launched our subspace adult programs after dark channel to host tonight's premiere episode, as well as the rest of our upcoming lineup over the next couple of months. We have some incredible events and experiences still to come, still to even be announced, potentially more coleslaw. Um, so I encourage you to check out our schedule on our website and keep coming back and hanging out with us after dark. I do need to thank the Lowell Institute Without them uh, and their continued support of the adult programming at the Museum of Science, tonight's episode would not be possible and it would not be free for all of us to enjoy. So please join me in a big virtual round of applause and thanks to the Lowell Institute. And finally, if you enjoy yourself tonight after the show, I ask you to go to mos.org slash science matters and show your support for MOS at home and allow us to keep bringing this type of programming into your homes. Once again, that's mos.org slash science matters. But now I'm going to turn it over to my wonderful friend. Please enjoy Coleslaw's Corner, Science in Drag. Have a good night. Hello there, beautiful humans. Coleslaw here, reporting live from my boudoir. You may or may not know me from being the hostess of the award-winning drag spectacular Coleslaw's Corner, which takes place at the Museum of Science Boston's Charles Hayden Planetarium. Since we have all been quarantined in order to flatten the curve of COVID-19, and all of our shows have been postponed indefinitely. We decided to collaborate and bring you some online educational entertainment. Yeah, I am so very honored and excited to be interviewing Talia Sapersky, who is the planetarium coordinator at the Museum of Science Boston's Charles Hayden Planetarium. I myself am not ashamed to admit that I am somewhat of a sci-fi geek myself. After all, Jane Fonda, starring as the titular character of the science fiction classic Barbarella, just happens to be one of my greatest drag inspirations. Like many of you watching at home from your computer screens, I myself have also always pondered and been fascinated and pondered some more about the mysteries of the universe, uh, such as how are the epic pyramids of Giza or the haunting statues of Easter Island constructed all the way back then without any modern day machinery? 
what could it have possibly sounded like if Pink Floyd had made the fantastic decision to create a sister album for Dark Side of the Moon entitled The Bright Side of the Sun? In the very lucky circumstances that you are able to witness a falling star in the sky and you just so happen to make the mm, on the spot decision to put a wish upon that falling star, would in fact that wish be granted or has this all been some sort of Disney propaganda mumbo jumbo? Now, what did come first? The chicken or the egg? I don't know. I need to know. Who knows? I need to know. Tell me. Is there really such a thing as a stupid question? I'm about to ask Talia the hard-hitting questions. Well, not those questions specifically, but some more pressing, technical, and glittery questions that I want to know answers for. The questions that only an expert in their field would know. I have questions and I need answers. Hello everyone! Welcome! I, uh, I am so excited because today I'm going to be interviewing the Boston Charles Hayden Planetarium's coordinator, Talia Zapersky. Talia, can you hear me? I can indeed. Hey, oh, you look so gorgeous. How are you feeling? I'm doing good. I love your hair. Thank you. They're a little uneven. Sisters, not twins. Talia. I'm so happy that I'm here with you. We have the hard hitting questions that people want to know the answers to. And guess what? What? You better bring it. So I, I read a little bit about you, Talia. I read a little bit about you, Talia, and I see that you have lots of uh, college degrees. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? So uh, I studied astrophysics in undergrad, so I have a bachelor's in astrophysics. And then I went and got my master's in science writing because I always knew I wanted to talk about science. When you say science writing, what exactly are you writing about science about about? Well, I always loved space best, so I was hoping I could find a way to become a, a science writer who focused on space. But I got out of grad school uh, right in 2009 when uh, all of the publications were laying off their writers, so I wound up, you know, engaging in the time-honored tradition of moving in with my parents instead. Okay. But I did eventually wind up getting to do, getting to talk about space in a different way at the planetarium. Well, hallelujah, amen. Thank you for parents. Now tell me, have you ever seen one of the Coleslaw Corner shows? I have, yes. Which one was your favorite? I'm assuming you saw more than one. I really loved um, Kaya Kristall saying, uh, I know where I've been from the musical Hairspray. And I just, that really stuck out to me. I loved that performance so much. Hell yeah, shout out Kaya Kristall. Ooh, ooh. Oh yes, also before we start, we have a specialty drink that we were asking all of our viewers to drink with us. It's entitled the Chromatica in honor of Lady Gaga's sixth album, which comes out on the 29th. Uh, now, usually I would drink um, a specialty Cosmo, which is basically what this drink is, in a martini glass, but since we're quarantined and we're in a Zoom meeting, I figured I'd use the good old secret mug. Well, um, I'm here to, to ask you the hard-hitting questions about space travel and space life and galactic life in the galactic galaxies. Gal galax gal <laughs> We're going to journey into a, a world of questions. We're going to find out what everyone wants to know. Okay, question number one. I am curious about silence in space. They do say, famous quote, in space, no one can hear you scream. Now I'm just wondering, is that a real thing or is that like a space rumor? 
No, nope, that is a space fact. In space, no one can hear you scream because it's a vacuum. Sound waves need something to move through, like air or water, to get from whatever's making the sound to your ear. There is none of that in space, which means there's nothing for to transmit the sound uh, to your ear. So in fact, in space, nobody can hear you scream. Wow, that's really disturbing. <laughs> So you're referring to vacuums, which are one of my favorite pieces of machinery. Um, can you explain more about this vacuum? What causes this vacuum? It's probably a less useful vacuum than the kind uh, you that is your favorite appliance. But th when we refer to the vacuum, we are referring to uh, anywhere outside of an atmosphere. So out in space and people tend to think of that as being totally empty which is kind of what vacuum means it turns out it's not completely empty there is dust particles there are a few air molecules here and there but it's empty enough that we can say it's a vacuum right okay that scares me talia i know there's a planet made of diamonds don't lie to me it's called 55 Cancri E, and it's twice the size of planet Earth. Spill the tea. So I have good news for you. 55 Cancri E does exist. Uh, the bad news is it might not be quite as much of a diamond as you might hope it is. Uh, well, so I love diamonds. I'll never own any because I'm a millennial, but I love diamonds. So the claim that 55 Cancri E was a planet-sized diamond uh, was based on an analysis of the carbon to oxygen ratios in the star 55 Cancri. And it seemed like it had a lot of carbon. And that would have meant that a lot of carbon was present in the nebula from which its planets were born. And that's what a diamond is. It's compressed carbon. And when a planet is formed, it's a whole bunch of stuff getting compressed. So if that stuff getting compressed is carbon, it turns into Kiss on the hand, maybe quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but won't pay the rental on your humble flat or help you at the Auto map men grow cold as girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Which would mean the whole system has a lot less carbon in it. Now, I'm not going to shatter your dreams completely. This doesn't mean that 55 canker E isn't completely made of diamond. It just means it's much less likely. It is possible that it formed in a particularly carbon-rich area of that nebula and is, in fact, mostly made of compressed carbon or diamond. It's just a lot less likely. You know, I would imagine a planet made of diamonds would be very, very sharp and hard to walk on. It wouldn't be a great place to hang out, no. And also, it would... it's very close to its star, so it's very, very hot. Well, I mean, it might be hot and not that fun to be on, but it is like a gosh darn diamond, so... <laughs> Anyways, let's move right along. <laughs> I heard a little rumor, Talia. Yes? So I was digging and digging for some hot, sparkly topics to ask Italia, and it came across this one little nugget that really popped my top. I heard that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. True or false? We believe that that is true. We believe that uh, our Milky Way alone, our galaxy, contains about somewhere between two and four hundred billion stars. And our Milky Way is one of about two trillion galaxies that we know about in the visible universe. So once you start multiplying those numbers together, the number of zeros goes up very, very, very quickly. So I would imagine in order to be a, a scientist, you'd really have to be good at the mathematicals. 
Mm, yes and no. Fortunately, we have uh, invented things like calculators and computers, and they are very good at doing the math for us. What you do need to understand is what the math is telling you. That's important. Tolly, I gotta lay it on you. I'm really bad at math. Or do you judge me any differently? Not at all. And if you need to count on your fingers and toes, who the heck cares? <laughs> astrology. Do you I have a problem with astrology. So astrology is based on the idea that the movement of objects in the sky, particularly um, the movement of certain constellations, which we call the zodiac, uh, and the movement of the planets affect your life here on the Earth, and there's just literally no way it can be true. Right. So what's your sign, Talia? Oh, well that depends. Are we using the 12 traditional signs of the zodiac, or are we using the 13 signs that the sun actually passes through on its way through the sky over the course of the year? We're using the kind that you find in a cheap newspaper. Well, a cheap newspaper will tell you that I'm a Virgo, but I can tell you for a fact that the sun was in the boundaries of the constellation Leo on the day I was born. Okay, well, let me just say that's a very sun and Leo thing of you to say. Also, hi, fellow Virgo. <laughs> mm. oh my God, we're the best, aren't we? I mean, we are. Talia! The concept of a black hole fascinates me. A massive void that consumes everything that approaches it. Can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. Black holes are fascinating, for sure. They're very weird objects. Uh, they are, what they are is a lot of mass. So a couple of mass, you know, a couple of times the mass of our sun, at least compressed down into something smaller than your fist. So it's an extremely dense object, which means it is quite gravitationally powerful. It's got a lot of mass. And as we said before, gravity comes from mass. Now, where they get it a little bit wrong is that black holes don't, you know, suck stuff in. They're not space vacuums. And by vacuum here, I mean the appliance, not the void of space. Hoover. <laughs> the Hoover type, yes. So black holes are not space Hoovers. They're just very massive objects with a lot of gravity. If you were to take the sun away and put a black hole of the same mass in its place, the planets wouldn't notice. They would just keep orbiting because the same amount of mass is in the same place. Where it gets weird is when you get close to it. So if you get close to a black hole, the gravity is so powerful that things start to behave strangely around it. Light will bend its path. Uh, objects will get ripped apart because the gravity is pulling harder on one part of them than on another. And so it's the region right around a black hole where things start to get a little iffy. And if something gets pulled in beyond what we call the event horizon, that's when we can't see what happens to it anymore. That's the point beyond which light cannot escape, which means we can't see what's going on. So that's why we're not quite sure all of what's going on with black holes, because there's this reason, region beyond which we can't see any of it. That's also why we call them black holes. Now, black holes also give rise to one of my favorite science vocab words. Remember how I said uh, if you say, let's say you were um, falling into a black hole feet first and the gravity of the black hole is actually pulling harder on your feet than it is on your head, which means you're going to get stretched and pulled and eventually pulled into a spaghetti stream of atoms. And this process, I kid you not, is called spaghettification. You're making me hungry, Talia. I'm always hungry, so I get that. I think we might be meant to be life partners. Quite possibly. I'm getting that vibe. So you talk about spaghettification. What happens once this body is noodleified? That's the mysterious part. We don't know what goes on inside the event horizon of a black hole. We can't see it. Do you we think there's just a bunch of stretched out noodles? 
We suspect that all that matter gets conglomerated onto the central mass, which is very, very tiny, and that that central mass is actually very, very, very bright if we could just see it, but we can't because the light can't escape from it. Well, I hope if I ever get trapped in a black hole with a spedification process, I hope that I have some Parmesan cheese on me. So tell me, Talia, have, uh, has there ever been a photograph of a black hole? Sort of. Again, we can't see the black hole itself, but last year, a group from a telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope released an image which showed the shadow of the event horizon of a black hole. It kind of looked, you might have seen it in the news, it looks like a fuzzy red donut. And looks like a Nine Inch Nails album cover. Or a Nine Inch Nails album cover. So what you're seeing there, the red light is actually material behind the black hole, gas clouds and the like, which is glowing. And in front of it, that, that black donut hole is the event horizon. It's that point beyond which we can't see anything. So it is the first time we've ever seen an image of a supermassive black hole or even the region that close around it. And to do it, the Event Horizon Telescope is not one telescope. It takes advantage of a method called interferometry, which allows you to take a bunch of telescopes spaced apart from each other and splice together their data like they're one huge telescope. And to get that picture, they had to use telescopes scattered from the South Pole to Northern Europe, which means they were basically simulating a telescope the size of the Earth in order to get that image. Wow, that's a, that's a honking telescope, Talia. So tell me, Talia, I know that you like the sci-fi films, and I myself am a big fan of the Alien franchise. And listen, in the Alien franchise, there's always that time when someone breaks a hole in the hull of the ship, and then the corpse of someone gets sucked out through the hole and liquefied and thrown into space. Or in other sci-fi films, someone will fall out into space and shatter into a million flesh ice cubes. So tell me, Talia, what would happen if I were to fall into space without an astronaut suit? Well, you would die. Um, you wouldn't die immediately. I'm a horror fan. I'm all for it. Let's see it. Let's throw a subject out into space. Talia, do you want to volunteer? Um, no, I'm good. I'm good. We're Maybe good. that old lady that lives in my building is always really rude to me. Let's volunteer her. Guess what, Talia? It's game time. We're gonna play two truths and one lie. Listen, two of these facts, <laughs> I'm gonna read you three facts about space. Two of these facts are true, and one is a lie, Fib. That's right, you're gonna pick out the lie. And if you're wrong, you get a buzzer. <laughs> you're gonna be shamed by your peers. Question number one, topic is, our sun. A. The sun makes up half of all mass in our solar system. B. Light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us on Earth. C. Neptune radiates more heat than it receives from the sun. A. The sun is more than half of the mass in the solar system. Ding, 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 dong. The lie is number A. The sun actually takes up 99% of all mass in our solar system. Ready for number two? The category is space travel. A, one full NASA spacesuit costs one million dollars. B, spacecrafts have visited every planet in our solar system. C, a hatch door malfunction during the first spacewalk led to the discovery that if two pieces of the same type of metal touch in space, they can fuse together permanently. Uh, C. Mm, wrong! <laughs> um, it's number A. NASA space suits actually cost $12 million, 70% of which that, 70% of that cost is for the backpack and control module. 
the next one category is space oddities a one constellation in our night sky includes a mystery star by the name of Kraz. To this day, no one knows where the name Kraz came from. B. Astronomers from Switzerland believe that one observed exoplanet might be covered in hot ice. C. The planet Kepler 13AB is known to snow titanium oxide, the ingredient ion most self <laughs> contained in most self tanners. That's a tough one. They're trying you. I'm gonna say B. Hot ice does seem quite foolish to say, but however, <clears throat> number C was the uh, lie. It snows titanium oxide, the main ingredient in most sunscreens, not self tanners. That's sneaky. <laughs> the next segment is a lightning round of questions for Talia. Let's learn more facts about you in one minute or less. We're gonna put one minute on the clock and see how many of the following questions you can get through in order for our viewers to learn more about you. you okay. Ready? ready, set, go. What is your favorite planet? Saturn. If you had to remove the title of planet from one, which would it be? Mercury. What's your favorite sci-fi film? Apollo 13, which isn't fiction so much, so The Martian. What's your favorite constellation? Cygnus the Swan. If you could volunteer to lead an expedition of life on Mars, which would never return, would you go? No, I would like to come back. <laughs> if you could have become an educator in any other field of science, which would it be? Geosciences, Earth science. Which famous astronaut do you think is the most fabulous? I'm pretty a pretty big fan of Jim Lovell. Do you believe aliens exist? Yes, but not that, that they visited Earth. What do you think the hardest part of living in space would be? Surviving. Who's fiercer, Ripley or Sarah Connor? Ripley. Leia or Rey? Leia. Star Wars or Star Trek? Ugh, Star Trek, but by like, mm, a If bit. you could have drinks with one sci-fi character, who would it be? I would love to hang out with Dr. McCoy from Star Trek. Do you think that I, Coleslaw, would make a good astronaut? I think so, because you're a very inventive, creative person. Okay, remove one from existence. Interstellar, Gravity, or Starship Troopers? Interstellar. Ew, I love that movie. Favorite Bowie song? Uh, Space Oddity. Ding dong, ding dong. Did we make the clock? Oh my goodness, I feel like we did. There's definitely been a clock running this whole time you've been answering those questions, Talia. That wasn't actually the last game we're gonna play, Talia. There's another one. Oh boy. All right, this time, we're going to name that science fiction film. I'm going to recite a famous science fiction quote. Can you name the film? Easy mode. I'm a leaf on the wind. Watch how I soar. Serenity. Get away from her, you bitch! Aliens. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. 2001, A Space Odyssey. He who controls the spice controls the universe. Dune. Take your pu- <laughs> <laughs> The answer is Planet of the Apes. Hold <laughs> on. Multipass. The fifth element. <laughs> <laughs> the answer of- <laughs> The ans- mm. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That was my Helen Marin impersonation. story <laughs> it's the adult um section version uh now we're gonna move on to the hard mode and i don't even know all these so good freaking luck 
I've seen things you people wouldn't believe! Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion! I watch sea beams glitter in the dark near the Chanhauser Gate! All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in the rain! Blade Runner. It was actually from Funny Girl, you're wrong. Jake Hagels. They say one secret crop somewhere. You have officially colonized it, so technically, I colonized Mars. In your face, oh, Neil Armstrong. The Martian. <laughs> You're so good. I've never seen this film. For someone who has never meant for this world, I must confess, I'm suddenly having a hard time believing it. Of course, they say every atom in our bodies was once part of a star. Maybe I'm leaving. Maybe I'm just going home. <laughs> Gattaca? Gattaca? Gattaca. Gattaca. I have Gattaca. seen it. What is this thing? I mean, it serves no useful purpose for there to be a bunch of chompy, crushy things in the middle of the hallway. No, I mean... We shouldn't have to do this because it makes no logical sense. Why is it here? Well, forget it. I'm not doing it. The episode was badly written. <laughs> Galaxy Quest. <laughs> yeah. Sigourney Beaver. You know, we're sitting on four million pounds of fuel, one nuclear weapon, and a thing that 270,000 moving parts built by the lowest bidder. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? Armageddon. <laughs> oh, I don't think you're gonna get this one. <laughs> 1,500 years ago, everybody knew that the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everyone knew that the Earth was flatter. 15 minutes ago, you knew that humans were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. Men in black. Hell yeah. Talia, do you have any questions about me and my life as a drag performer? I was actually wondering how you learned to do such fabulous eye makeup because I'm somebody who doesn't habitually wear makeup and I find it very confusing. It is very confusing and actually it just kind of takes a long time with any like artistic practice, be it baking or drawing or painting or making music, you know, playing the piano, whatever, what have you, styling hair, I don't heckin' know. It just takes practice, you just have to do it over and over and over again, watch tutorials, gather inspirations, make a lookbook, you know? Just get inspirations, um, ask for help whenever you need it. YouTube has like a bajillion um, videos that'll teach you basic steps and then you can put your own little spin on it. I like to play with color. I like to play with shape and texture. So usually I would be covered in glitter, but I didn't put it on today because I felt like I was more professional without it. Talia, Talia. If you could give advice to anyone out there who dreams of working in this field or in a planetarium, what would it be? It would be to make sure, first and foremost, that you really love it. Um, you, people you find working in museums, talking about whatever the museum is focused on, in our case it's science and in the planetarium it's space, we do it because it's our favorite thing to do. We love doing it, so make sure that you have that, otherwise it's gonna get old for you. Um, I love talking about space. I love learning new things about space. It's my favorite thing. So that's one of the reasons this job is great for me. And if you have that, then I highly recommend trying to find a planetarium near you. There are many, not just relatively big ones like us at the Charles Hayden Planetarium. There are small planetariums all over the country. And go to those places and see what their shows look like, see what their techniques are. Maybe you can get internships or even part-time jobs um, to get your foot in the door and just keep learning about the thing you love and just keep doing that. And that is the biggest thing. I never stop learning about space. It's the way I keep my planetarium shows up to date and it helps that I really love doing that. So that's my biggest piece of advice. 
It's been seriously such a thrill to be speaking to you, Talia. I've had such a fun time chit-chatting about this and that and hitting the hard questions. I need to know the question answers. So I want everyone to please go to the Boston Charles Hayden Planetarium and check Talia out in one of her many daily shows and presentations in the dome. Give her a handshake and tell her coleslaw sent ya. Bye, Talia. Mwah. Keep being beautiful. Oh, thank you. You too. <laughs> wow, what a whirlwind of information. Here are three takeaways from today's interview. If, like myself, you've ever found yourself wondering, where does spaghetti come from? Black holes, baby. Who would have seen that one coming? A planet made of diamonds is not at all as glamorous as it sounds. I think that we can all find solace in knowing that if we are ever thrown out of a spaceship but naked, we'll just turn into a giant fleshy ice cube floating around forever and ever until you hit an asteroid and you shatter into a million tiny shards. One last thing, once this quarantine is lifted and society begins functioning normally again, make sure that you go out and support your local planetarium. Wow, this is Coleslaw and I am signing off. I hope you have the best night ever. There's a life on Mars.